glad you're able to join us this morning. We are going to begin a series focusing on the after effects of Easter. It's called the rumblings of Easter as we talk about the impact of the resurrection. Uh, one of the updates that we have is that we have ordered and received our Vacation Bible School material. We're hoping that we can have it and that children will be coming in August. So think about it and pray about it that we'll actually be able to have this fantastic time for VBS. Um, would you pray with me, please? Father, we come before you today and we are grateful for the love that you send to us. We are grateful that you don't believe in spiritual and social distancing in fact that you sent jesus from heaven to be your expression of love we thank you that jesus took on flesh and took on blood and that he walked and talked among people that he ministered to the crowds that he wrapped his arms around the leper that he allowed children to crawl on his lap and that the ultimate expression of his love is that he stretched out his arms on the cross to give us the biggest hug possible and then he sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. Because of who you are and what you've done, we thank you that we aren't, as it says, the hashtag alone together, but we are not alone together. Though some are told that they aren't essential workers, we can have the assurance that we're all essential to you, for you told us that you so love the world that you gave your one and only son to be with us. We pray for those who are affected by the coronavirus. We pray for those who are affected by the fear surrounding it, for people who are trying to uh, get into medical care but can't and, and need medical care. We are alarmed at the growing rate of suicides and abuse, and our hearts are moved for all of these things. And we just pray, God, that you could be working in the middle of this situation as we're told you are in charge and you redeem even the worst of things for your honor and glory. May you show your power at this time, Lord. We pray for Ron and his, his wife is in the hospice, that you would be with her and with Ron as they're going through a difficult time being separated and can't see one another, um, that you would just be speaking into their lives at, at this time. We thank you that Linda's mom has recovered well and doing well at home and pray for Anita as she goes to the doctor tomorrow that uh, wouldn't be necessary for her to have surgery on her foot. Uh, we thank you, God, that you care for us and that you love us. And may we, in turn, show that love and joy that you've given to us to those that we communicate with and in our communities. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. We want to share together, we want to worship Jesus Christ, the one who has given his life for us. And if you were present, I definitely ask you to stand because this is a song that you need to stand to sing. So if you want to stand while you're home there and sing along, uh, feel free. You can sing it out louder and stronger that way. It's the song, In Christ Alone Our Hope Is Found. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. Body lay, life. 
light of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. <clears throat> no guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry till final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand. He returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. Earthquakes. Just mentioning the word makes us want to shiver and shake. Experiencing one definitely isn't on my bucket list. Um, people may be surprised that there was an earthquake that took place when Christ died. Immediately after he gave up his spirit, the earth shook and the rocks split. It was one of the signs that terrified the Roman soldiers who were standing guard and caused their commander to exclaim, Surely he was the Son of God. People may be even more surprised to hear there was a second shaking of the earth when Christ rose from the grave. The Bible tells us there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. And the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. This second rumbler also profoundly affected those battle-hardened soldiers, as we heard. He said they became terrified again and fainted dead away. Now, I wonder if it was the same group of soldiers who were at both places, because that would be for them, they'd be thinking, deja vu, here we go again, been there, done this, don't want to do it again. Maybe it got them to thinking more about who Jesus was or who that person that had been in there was and what was, power did he have. Well, earthquakes often have aftershocks. And the same is true spiritually for Easter. Now, it seems like our celebration of Easter was so long ago, but it was only a week ago, but it seems like it was forever ago because we've had snow since then and all sorts of restrictions that continue upon us. But it was just last Sunday. But Easter isn't to be just a one-and-done kind of deal. It has aftershocks, reverberations, rumblings, ongoing effects. There are loads of biblical texts that talk about the, the impact and results of the resurrection, and we'll by no means get to all of them. And as we spend several weeks discovering the importance of the resurrection, we have to begin with what the resurrection means for Jesus Christ. By doing so, we'll see what kind of God we serve. As followers of Jesus Christ, our main priority is to worship Christ. We're to love him and surrender our lives to him. And we can never love or care about Jesus too much. 
The passage that we're going to begin with is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And there'll be lots of other places in the Bible that I'll reference, but I can't give all, all the references. Um, so the, if you want to get a copy of the sermon from the website, you can find all the references there. But we'll begin with 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and reading only a few verses, verses 1 through 7. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers at the same time most of whom who are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. The word gospel is used twice in those first two verses. It, it means good news or good message. It's the teaching of and about Christ. It's what's been revealed from God. R.C. Sproul said this about the gospel. It's the possession of Christ. But even more, Jesus is the heart of the content of the gospel. At the heart of this gospel was the announcement of who Jesus was and what he had accomplished in his lifetime. The gospel is about Jesus, what he did, his life of perfect obedience, his atoning death on the cross, his resurrection from the dead, his ascension into heaven, and his outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the church. In preaching the gospel, we preach about Jesus, and we preach about how we are brought into a saving relationship with him. The gospel, the good news, is Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus is at the core of Christianity, and if we were to keep reading 1 Corinthians 15, we'd see the insight the Apostle Paul has given about what would be true if Jesus Christ hadn't risen from the dead. But he quickly counters by saying Jesus has been raised from the dead, and it has profound implications for Jesus himself, but also for people, for his followers. And in the verses that we read, Paul gives the basic teachings of Christianity. Jesus' life, his death, burial, resurrection, appearances. And it shouldn't be a surprise that the resurrection of Jesus Christ formed the essential part of the belief of the early church. If it were a lie, it would have been foolish for them to hold on to it in the face of severe persecution. People don't cling to something as being true when they know it's a lie when they are faced with death. And shortly after Jesus had risen, the disciples met to replace Judas, the one who had betrayed Jesus. They met to re replace Judas with another man who would be called an apostle. And one of the requirements was that he would become a witness of the truth of the resurrection. The resurrection was really what they were preaching. It was part and parcel of everything that they were teaching. Peter included it in his monumental sermon 50 days after Christ's resurrection. At Pentecost, he proclaimed this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, by wonders and signs, which God did among you through him as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. A few days later, a crowd gathered because God used Peter and John to heal a man who had been crippled from birth. Peter declares that they killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And the healing miracle got the disciples in hot water with religious leaders who were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Now this particular complaining group of religious leaders was known as the Sadducees. 
They were the group that was in charge of the temple and they made their living and their income from the temple and by taking a portion of the sacrifices. Uh, they were having a very good life on earth and they didn't believe in a resurrection because they really didn't need one and they didn't see any benefit to it. And they didn't think about an afterlife re as being real or a possibility. And there are people today who have a similar view. They're focused on this current world and either don't see a need for anything beyond it or because life is so good for them or they feel that they're smarter than the rest and they see no need to believe in something that would be a pipe dream. It's often those who face difficulties and hardships who aren't among the elite or the rich who look forward to a future in a different existence, to heaven, to a resurrection from the dead. It gives them hope and a backdrop for deciphering this life that we're in. Someone said this, Christians, whether rich or poor, smart or otherwise, well-educated or not, should prize the resurrection as much as anything else. And they said, to the extent that the resurrection is not significant to you, to that extent you are not considering yourself to be a citizen of heaven. Those are some pretty strong words about the importance of the resurrection. Well, back to Jesus. We said we wanted to focus on what the resurrection did for Jesus as we've been discussing it. and We've been observing that the, what the resurrection means for him. The first thing is means that he's alive. Now, that sounds like I'm stating the obvious because that's what resurrection means. It's kind of a duh moment. But it's incredibly important to us to focus on that. And remember that he isn't dead. He isn't in the grave. His body wasn't stolen and placed someplace where nobody could find his bones. He's alive because he's been raised from the dead. And his resurrection is unlike any other resurrection of people in the Bible or people today or in the past who've claimed that they've died and come back to life after they've been dead for 60 or 90 minutes. Because all those people, once they've, they've come alive, but they subsequently have all died or will die. Jesus Christ is alive and he will never die again. Scripture tells us, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. He's not like the false gods either that people worship who are either dead, their founders are dead, or they never existed, or it's just some made-up idea. He's completely separate as he is the God who is alive. Second thing about Jesus. The resurrection means Christ is telling the truth. He had told people that he would have to die and that he would rise again. One day he spoke to Martha, who was mourning the loss of her brother Lazarus who died and was in the grave for four days at this point. Jesus comforted her and reassured her that her brother would be raised to life. And he said this, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies, and whoever lives and believes in me will never die. But then he asked her, do you believe this? Well, this gets into the impact for us, and we'll dig deeper into that another time. But Jesus identifies himself as the resurrection. He expressed it in the present tense, meaning that death doesn't have a permanent effect on him. If Jesus is still in the tomb, then nothing he said can be trusted. Jesus' resurrection proves his believability. Since he can be trusted about what we could call the biggest thing, about raising somebody life himself to life, he can be trusted about all the smaller things of life. The third way Jesus' resurrection affects him is since he's going to some other place, he needed to provide a replacement. Jesus ascended to the Father from whom he received the Holy Spirit. Now, we're not privy how that all worked among the, the Trinity, the Godhead, and it sounds like some kind of handoff. If you wanted to put it in football terms, it's like the Father has the Holy Spirit who gives it to the Son who passes it to earth, him, him to earth. Well, the Holy Spirit has been given by God to Jesus, and he, the Holy Spirit had been operating according to Father's instructions, but now he's given to Jesus who, to facilitate Christ's presence on earth. Jesus Christ's last conversation with the disciples included the promise that he would send the Holy Spirit. 
He said he'd ask the Father to give another counselor who would be the comforter. And both the Father and, the, and Jesus the Son are credited with sending the Holy Spirit. It talks about the, the uniqueness and the connectedness of the Trinity. And the Holy Spirit would have the unique ability to live inside of believers, whereas Jesus was confined to a human body, could only be one place at one time. Suffice it to say for now that the Spirit would come to guide Christ's followers. And we'll get to more on that, more on the Holy Spirit's role in weeks to come. So there's a couple things that we can anticipate as we talk more about the impact of the resurrection. The fourth thing about Christ and the resurrection is that Jesus experienced a change of location. He's no longer limited or confined to earth. And it wasn't though like he was going to someplace new as he was returning to a place from where he had previously existed. Jesus returns home, you could say. He's again in heaven with the other members of the Trinity, with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, who would soon be sent to earth. And the most frequent terms used to describe what happened to Jesus Christ is that he is exalted, as in God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And it's also mentioned that he is glorified, as in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. We're told that Christ is seated at God's right hand with the angels and authorities and powers in submission to him. We're further told that he's far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Christ's position is unlike that of any other being in the universe. Because he's at the right hand of the Father. which is, And he is subject only to God the Father. This means he's above everything else. All spiritual powers and principalities of the supernatural world. Whether they're of the demonic world or of the good angelic world. He sits far above all human governments, those who are kings or those who would be kings. He's more powerful than the devil, more powerful than Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos, more powerful than a virus. Jesus was restored to possessing all the power he had before he came to earth. And he's waiting for a future day when he'll exercise that power in both judgment and reward. There's one particular entity that's singled out and given a little bit more space there. It's, it talks about Jesus is over this particular thing. It says Jesus is head over everything for the church. Being the head means that he's the control center. He's the master. He's the boss. And all of his authority is expressed with love. And the church is referred to as his body. The fullness of him who fills everything in every way. This means that Jesus Christ expresses himself through the church who's present in the world today. It's how Christ is represented on earth and how he's communicated. The fifth thing for Christ is that his work for the church is continuing. We're told because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus qualifies in this position of the perfect high priest because he never sinned. He's holy and he's blameless and pure. As the high priest, he's the representative between God and people. And since he has already offered the full and sufficient sacrifice for sins, he can bring people into God's presence. He offers salvation that is complete and for all time and is effective for all who come to him in faith and he presents all who do to the Father. Christ's work is like that of a defense attorney in the courtroom of heaven where we also see the devil. The devil is the prosecutor who has an airtight case against the people he's accusing. And he usually resorts to lies, but he doesn't need to. He simply states the truth. Exhibit A is a list of times and items 
where he's coveted. Exhibit B details her impure thoughts. Exhibit C presents where she's acted on those thoughts. Exhibit D, drunkenness. Exhibit E, envy. And he asked the bailiffs of heaven to bring in the certified evidence of hatred, bitterness, gossip, lying, stealing, slander, being an enemy of God, and all these things until the courtroom is full of evidence. He rests his case. The defense attorney, Jesus Christ, steps forward to present his case. And without saying a word, he just slowly extends his hands to reveal the scars. And the judge drops his gavel and declares, not guilty! See, when a person comes to know Christ as his Savior, when they've admitted that they're sinners and they can't save themselves and they need help from some outside source, not a human source, because nobody could earn it or pay it for their salvation, that they're depending upon what Jesus Christ has done on that cross and his death and resurrection and say, I'm putting my trust in Jesus alone for my salvation. I'm going to live for him. I want to follow him. Nobody can point to that person and say they're guilty and need to pay for their sins because Jesus has taken them away. We come under no punishment for our sins. We can't be retried. That's the meaning of the word justification, being legally declared not guilty. We're told, though, that Jesus is also pleading our case on an ongoing basis because the question is asked in Romans where it says, Who is he that condemns? And very quickly, the answer is given. Jesus Christ, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. And this verse is in the passage that reminds us that God works all things together for good of those who love him. And that we're more than conquerors because of Jesus Christ. And that there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He says that nobody can condemn us because of the facts. Christ died and he's in the position of authority and he's currently interceding for us. We often focus on the aspect of Christ dying for us that is the thing that leads to us not being condemned. But the part we overlook is the role Christ's resurrection exerts on that. It's the companion to the crucifixion and it supplies the proof that the resurrection was effective. And because of the resurrection and the crucifixion being tied together, we aren't condemned if we've placed our faith and confidence in Jesus Christ alone. The book of 1 John also expresses the idea of Jesus being our defender when we sin. It says that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice. He's our advocate. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins and the sins of the whole world and that as such he satisfies and appeases God's wrath and he assures us that he's saving a place for us and it's been bought and paid for and he's our advocate when we stumble in sin and he presents it to God if we turn and repent from, from it. Lloyd Ogilvy summarized Christ's work as an intercessor by putting it this way. Christ is our link with the Father's heart, bringing our needs to him and then bringing to us the God's guidance, wisdom, power, and we could say assurance of forgiveness and love and all sorts of other things. Sixth, the resurrection proclaims Christ's deity. Now, you may think that this would have been a good place to start, and the first one we could begin with, true, but it's also a good one to point to, to bring our thoughts toward a conclusion here. Jesus Christ was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. The amazing thing we're told is that Jesus raised himself. Jesus said at the beginning of his ministry that he was going to do it. He pointedly told people, said, you destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it again. People misunderstood, and they thought he was talking about a physical building, the temple in Jerusalem. They said it had taken 46 years to build it, and he's going to, it, once it's tear, torn down, he's going to somehow raise the building up in three days? Impossible. And the disciples didn't understand what Jesus was talking about until after he had risen from the dead. 
It said, then they put two and two together that he'd spoken of the temple as being his body. It said, then they believed the scripture and the words Jesus had spoken. And Jesus demonstrates his He's God because he raises himself from the dead. And only God can do something that miraculous. Now, other places it talks about God the Father doing the raising too, but they're all involved in raising Christ from the dead and proving his deity. Now, I could have and maybe should have had seven points because seven is perfection and Jesus is perfect. So I didn't have seven, but maybe we can consider this conclusion as we wrap it up to be point seven. The conclusion we draw from all these things about how the resurrection impacts Jesus Christ himself is that God is the living God and the God of the living. We agree with scripture, and that's a good thing to do, because scripture tells us this. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance and then Paul adds, for this we labor and strive, that we work hard at teaching this and preaching it and declaring it and living it out. He said, this is the trustworthy saying, that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men and especially of those who believe. Uh, there's a biblical scholar, George Eldon Land, Ladd, who summarized the teaching of the resurrection. He puts it kind of in the negative again, as uh, parts of 1 Corinthians did. And he says this, If Christ is not risen from the dead, the long course of God's redemptive acts to save his people ends in a dead end street, in a tomb. If the resurrection of Christ is not reality, then we have no assurance that God is the living God, for death has the last word. Faith is futile because the object of that faith has not vindicated himself, vindicated himself as the Lord of life. Christian faith is then incarcerated in the tomb along with the final and highest self-revelation of God in Christ, if Christ is indeed dead. Aren't you glad that he's not dead? Aren't you thrilled by that, that Jesus is not dead, but that he is alive? that he is resurrected, and we can say thanks be to God that Jesus is alive and well and living to show his love for us. Next week we'll look at more rumblings of Easter to see the impact and effects of Christ's resurrection on who we are. Let me just extend an invitation. If you realize that you have never put your trust, your personal trust in Jesus Christ to save you from your sins and that you'd like to do it. It's easy to do. Jesus said that even a child can understand that we could put our faith in Jesus Christ and believe God's word that he came to earth to die to take our place so that we don't have to pay for the penalty of our sins. We can admit we're sinners, admit that we need to, that we deserve to go to hell, that we need somebody to save us, to deliver us, and that Jesus Christ is, as God is the only one who could give that sufficient payment for our sins. And we put our trust in what he has done, not in our good works, not in how kind we are or that we're better than somebody else or that God's going to take everybody to heaven, but we say, Jesus, I ask you to be my Savior. I receive that gift of eternal life that you give to me. I take it for my own and my desire is to live for you and even tell others about what you have done. If you have done that, Jesus gives the assurance whoever has done that, whoever's believed, whoever's put their trust has eternal life and will never die. And if you've done that, if you could let me know, you could call me and I could talk to you more and help you to understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and help you in your growth and just rejoice with you. Let's pray together. God, we are grateful that you sent your one and only son into the world that we might live through him. As in Jesus' powerful name we pray, amen.